Good morning to the ELT world. It could be louder than that. I understand it's been a bit cold outside. Well, welcome to good old England. That's how it is here. Brace up. So good morning, everyone. Right, I, I would do the, the, uh, the traditional Catholic thing of asking you to talk to the... Now, I know you've spoken to the person to your right this morning, and maybe to the one who's on to your left. How about just turning around and... Or not turning around in case you are sitting behind a pair of very important people, and talk to someone behind and in front of you for five seconds, please and say the best things possible. <laughs> Now it's, <laughs> what did I start? Hello? <laughs> now I've got a few, I've got a few important announcements and if you're not listening, you would be in trouble if anything happens. So could I get your attention please? <laughs> Okay, a few classroom rules and regulations which you must obey at all times. First, smoking is not permitted in the premises here or across in, at Jury's Inn at all times. Please, if you feel like smoking, could you just move away from the premises and feel free to smoke? Of course, uh, keep your belongings with you at all times and do not leave your items unattended, please. Please really do. And if you see any unattended items, could you let any of the volunteers around know so we can clear them? There is no planned uh, fire alarm drill. So if you hear a fire alarm, it will in fact be an indication that there is a fire and we would need to evacuate. Hopefully that won't happen. There would be an announcement that would be broadcast for you to leave the, the, the premises. And please leave by the nearest available uh, exit. Do not use the lifts, please. And do follow instructions from members of staff. Do not stop to collect any special belongings if there is a fire alarm, because there might just be trouble around the corner, and it's safer for you to be out uh, than for your property to be out first. And if you or a colleague need medical attention during the conference, please speak immediately to a member of staff before it becomes an emergency. And any accidents must also be reported immediately so we can take appropriate measures to, to, to help. So welcome to the 53rd annual conference of ITFL. This is the third time ITFL has come to Liverpool. We were here in 2004, in 2013, when we were also accompanied by 80,000 members from, uh, uh, viewers from around the world. And this year we are proud to say the British Council, our strat partner, is broadcasting the sessions, all the plenaries. So we do, do hope an audience are tuned in and that there will be following the sessions and participating in some of the discussions. You will be spending the next few days uh, here in Liverpool in the company of like-minded professionals, and we hope that you will be meeting old friends, but also making new friends. And like I said yesterday, ITFL for me has often always re represented a family, a family of practitioners, because the best friends I have made in life have been through ITFL. I came to ITFL in 2007 for the very first time. Uh, I met Paola, whom I'll be introducing, uh, as a Hornby scholar in 2006, and we had a wonderful experience uh, preparing for ITFL 2007 in Aberdeen. 
and we all made lots of friends, and it's been a pleasure to meet her again after so many years, but also to see uh, lots of friends that I made in 2007, and all the friends that I've made over the years, and I hope that you go back with a list of friends and email addresses and phone contacts maybe that you can continue to keep the conversation going. So together we can build a world that is fully inclusive. As you can see, there is a new kind of precedent standing in front of you. We can't pretend to ignore that, but that tells us at surface level that ITFO is getting more and more international and inclusive. But inclusivity doesn't only lie in having I hope that was for ITFL, for all of us. Well, inclusivity doesn't only lie in having a brown or a blue or a black or a yellow president. It lies in our mindset and the things that we do. If an institution cannot move, if an institution, institution is so rigid that it can't move with the changing times and the realities of our world, no matter how many red, yellow, pink presidents and members of the committee you have, that will not be inclusive. So ITFL has come of age, and I hope that this would be the beginning of our journey to making the eye as tall as it can possibly be, and that involves not just welcoming members. Of course, we welcome members from around the world. We welcome people who want to join the different Sikh committees. But we need to do much more than just welcoming people. We need to be proactive in helping and supporting the professionals from around the world to become leaders, because the future of ITFL doesn't lie in the hands of a few people. It lies in the hands of these wonderful teachers around the world who are surviving in conditions that we cannot imagine and making the best of the little resources. Their resilience is what we need in ITFL. And I want to see an ITFL, I hope to see an ITFL that welcomes everyone and actually goes out to invite people. I was invited to join the YLTC committee in 2007 by a lady called Wendy Arnold. At that time, ITFL looked like some kind of heaven to me. But I met professionals and important people, people whom I had only seen through textbooks. I would not name them, there are so many, and there's one of them sitting right in front of me here. And these people were so down to earth, and for the first time I thought these people, who in my mind existed in heaven, were actually real human beings with the flesh. And for a teacher from the north of Cameroon, in the UK, in Wonderland, to meet these big names and interact with them like friends and ordinary human beings, that was life-changing. And when I was invited into uh, the YLTC um, committee, I welcomed it, not because I knew what it was about, but just because I wanted to keep that connection with other professionals I'd met at the conference. And my journey has took, taken me here. I think my journey is that of every teacher. Every teacher working in the conditions that I worked in before I came to the UK. ITFL presidents do not come from the tree. They, are, they don't fall from heaven. They come from the membership. And every one of us has the potential to be an ITFL trustee or a president. But above all, every one of us has the responsibility to nurture and support and encourage each other so that together we can all be presidents of this association and all be trustees of this association and be proud of our unity in diversity because that is what ELT has come to represent in the world. We can't represent one thing and act the other. Now I would stop the preaching, but I hope that I've made Made, I've, I've, I've set my mind and made it clear that we, 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 need, we, we are starting a journey and that I hope that this journey would be an enabling journey and not a journey where we are struggling to keep a center and a periphery. Thank you very much. In the last couple of months when I was pushed into the role of president, 
I have complained that ITFL president is too talkative because he speaks a lot, but also because ITFL president writes a lot. I have also complained that ITFL president is too writative. Is there a word like that, David? Okay. Oh, there is now. <laughs> And uh, the downside of that is that we, we do not often see the people who make things possible, the people who step out of their busy day job and volunteer to, to run the association. Of course, there are many of them in the room. There are lots of volunteers in the room, our SIC coordinators and SIC committee members, whom we would be uh, presenting to you towards the end of the, at the end of the conference, but I just wanted to say a big thank you to uh, the trustees, starting from just after our plenary speaker, the SIG representative, Judith. So if you have any questions about the six, Judith would be the right person to talk to. Just pull her at any point in the conference and talk to him, uh, to her, sorry. Uh, where I come from, in the north of Cameroon, there's someone we call Baba Chede. In Cote d'Ivoire, I learned that person is called Baba Che. Our Baba Che is Colin. He keeps all the money, and he keeps all the records and money. <laughs> so if you want to know whether we are misusing the, your money, talk to Colin. He's the right person to talk to. And next to Colin is the person who brings together, who coordinates the work of our 121 associates around the world, and that is Lou. So if you are thinking of starting up an association, in case you don't have a teacher association where you come from, and you're thinking of starting up a teacher association, and eventually uh, becoming an associate of ITFL, Lou is the person to talk to, and we are happy to, to help you set up your own teacher association in your context. And then we've got the person who does all the digital work. Of course, he's got a team around him. He's the chair of our digital committee, and he runs a lot of many of our digital platforms the most important of which I think is our web conference, but also the webinars that we have every month, and that's Sean. <laughs> and as you can see, Sean has got a huge responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> the Secretary General, of course, Ross, who very also kindly stepped in to be chair of the conference committee, thanks to, whose, well, whose, uh, thanks to whom we have this conference, working, of course, with the, the team of, of, of uh, our staff, Alison and, and the rest of the team. So, Ross, <laughs> please. And last but not the least is the very lovely Moicha, who has a special effect on men? <laughs> well, that's a gossip I picked up this morning. So if you go, going towards, if you go next to uh, Moita, be very careful. You may fall over. Men do fall over often. And Moita is in charge of the membership and marketing committee. So she's responsible for our membership, which includes us. This year, we are very proud again to announce our scholarship winners who are sitting right in front of us here. We started in 1991 with only one scholarship winner, and now we have got 25 of them. And here are our scholarship winners. Can you just turn around and, and wave to the world? As you would imagine, for those of you who come from far away, getting through the borders into the UK has never been, it's, has always been an achievement. <laughs> this year, Zainab, one of our scholarship winners from Pakistan, couldn't come here because she didn't have a visa. 
but we think that Zainab is still a worthy winner and we are proud that we had her on our list of winners and we know that she's watching this uh, uh, opening ceremony and we'll be watching the conference live from Pakistan. So could we just give a big shout to Zainab? I would like to thank all our key sponsors. Can we have a slide of our sponsors, please? <laughs> all right, okay. I would like to thank our sponsors, without whom parts of this event would not happen. They have donated very generously to make sure that this conference is another successful one. So thank you very much to all our sponsors. Today there would be a great opportunity to meet our patron. So look at the, the program for today and don't miss the opportunity to meet our patron at the ITFL stand. Please also note that at the end of this plenary session, we would have to leave the room immediately because those drums you see at the back would come down and break this room into many more uh, workshop rooms. So please, if you want to have a quick chat, just rush out and have a quick chat after, uh, outside the room. Having said that, I have the honor and the privilege to introduce to you the first, our opening plenary speaker, whom I have known for 12 years. In 2006, we were lucky winners of the Hornby Trust Scholarship to study for an MA in the UK. I went to the University of Warwick, and Paula went to the University of Leeds. And we worked together through that, the year and networked in many ways and have kept uh, the relationship going within the Hornby Alumni Network for 12 years now. And in the 12 years, I have never really needed to call her by any other name than Paula. And this morning, I did, I, it just dawned on me that I had to introduce her formally. So I've been trying to practice Paula's other name, which I have never needed. <laughs> and I am told that, I, in fact, I have spoken to other colleagues from Chile, and I ended up with four different pronunciations. Now I'm not sure which of them is right. So a Cameroonian pronunciation of her name would be Paula Rebolero. Did I get it? Okay. <laughs> so Paula holds a PhD from the University of Leeds in 2013. She obtained that in 2013. And during the time she was doing her PhD at Leeds, which corresponded with my PhD at Warwick, in our conversations, it did emerge that we're feeling more and more like academics and moving away from our role and identity as teachers. And Paula, in her research, spoke with lots of teachers and found that the gap between her and these teachers was beginning to widen and that was something she did not want to happen. But the data she collected and the relationships she built with these teachers were quite humbling to her and reminded her of her true roots. And she moved from being a researcher and used her research, of course, as a pathway into becoming a champion for teachers' rights. Since then, she has continued to work with teachers, developing teachers in her part of the country of the world, and has also helped to empower lots of teachers through different projects, one of which is the Champions, the Teacher Research Project called Champions Teachers Program, and the APTIS, which were both funded by the British Council. Paula comes from Chile, as I said, and she set up a network uh, she's co-founder of a network of researchers in ELT in Chile called RISELT. It is a privilege for me, Paula, to welcome a friend to the podium. May you share with us 
the wisdom of your work in Chile. Thank you. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Okay, sorry, my fans are a bit loud. <laughs> this is Latin America for you. Buenos dias. Good morning to all of you. Good morning to all of you watching. Uh, sweet dreams to everybody in Latin America. Um, <laughs> it's five in the morning to the people in my country, so I hope they watch this later when they wake up. In some parts of the country, it's actually 3 a.m., so maybe they're coming back from party and they're able to watch it. Um, but in any case, I'm very uh, proud and humble to be here, and I need to say a few thanks to a few people that have helped me uh, be here today. First of all, and probably most importantly, I need to thank the Hornby Trust. I was awarded the Hornby Trust in 2006, as Harry said, and it changed my life. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't because of that wonderful opportunity that I was given by the Hornby Trust. And secondly, of course, to the IHFL committee for giving me this opportunity. Um, Harry and Margit, who contacted me initially, but to the whole committee for trusting me, uh, okay. I hope I don't let you down. Um, anyway, um, the focus of my talk is teacher empowerment. This is something that I'm being passionate about for many, many years now. And what I'm going to try to do in this talk is try to say why I think we are in the twilight zone in terms of teacher empowerment, and also why I think we need to live it. Uh, so that is what we are going to be focusing on today. Um, but first, I would like, before I begin, I would like to make a few clarifications. Um, in our field, and I have noticed every time I come to IATFL or I go to other conferences, I've noticed that in our field we have this fixation for the new and for the who. The new for me involves um, new, a new, the, our, our need to search for a new methodology, a new approach, a new idea, a new method. And then the second one would be to look at the who. Who is the person who is talking? Who is the person who is sharing new ideas with us or not? Is it an expert? Is it a guru? Is it a big name? So we always seem to be focused on a new idea and the expert or the guru uh, talking. So I'm very sorry that I'm going to disappoint you in the two fronts. <laughs> I'm not going to try to offer any new idea because I believe we need to understand and examine what we already know. So there are things that we know that we need to re-examine or there are things that we think we know that probably we need to look in more detail. Uh, but I am not a guru, that is for sure. In fact, I was referred to by somebody in Twitter, me and another group of colleagues, as a micro-celebrity. <laughs> so I am not an expert, I am not a guru, I am a micro-celebrity. <laughs> I don't think that was a compliment anyway, but we will talk about this empowerment later. Um, I'm going to organize my talk in four different sections. First, we are going to get warmed up into why I think we are in the twilight zone. Then we are going to think about ways in which we can light the way of teacher empowerment. Then following the voices, where we are going to try to listen to the voice of teachers. And then finalize with leaving the twilight zone, with some principles for leaving the twilight zone that I think we are in terms of teacher empowerment. So, in the twilight zone, why am I talking about the twilight zone? Well, it was in 2009 that I first encountered the concept of teacher empowerment. I was doing research about teacher research and how teacher research can actually empower teachers. And um, I became very interested in the whole idea of teacher empowerment and I became uh, very interested in trying to find out how you can actually help teachers to become empowered. So, Lucky me, I was at the right place at the right time. The term and teacher empowerment keep coming up everywhere I went. So there were conferences that were called empowering teachers, and these kind of expressions keep coming up. 
empowering teachers through. We are going to do this by empowering teachers. Empower teachers can talks, uh, workshops, conference sessions, all talking about teacher empowerment. So there were things like, I don't know, we are going to empower teachers through digital tools, okay? Empowering teachers by promoting critical thinking, for example, everywhere I went. So I started to attend all these sessions to find out some of my questions. What is teacher empowerment? How we can actually empower teachers? How, whether we could promote any sort of empowerment? And what I found at the end of those sessions was a discussion about professional development, maybe some tips and ideas about what I could do in the classroom, uh, maybe a song, maybe a game, if lucky both, um, a video, you know, to use it in the classroom on a rainy day, that kind of thing. Uh, but there was no actual explicit mention of empowerment. What is it, how we uh, actually uh, promote it, whether it can be promoted or not, there was nothing really else there. And then um, I started to notice, actually there was very little interest on the whole idea of empowerment. And this is actually something that I found in Twitter. I was checking some Twitter where people were saying, what are the interesting topics of this year's conference? Hot topics of the conference. Ooh, what did I do? Uh, interesting talks, massive presentations. And teacher empowerment was nowhere. You could understand my panic. I'm going to talk about teacher empowerment and nobody seems to, to care. So it's not a very sexy topic. And people really are not talking about it. But that is a strange thing, it's everywhere. So then I was wondering, is teacher empowerment then yet another buzzword? Are we are just using the word empowerment probably because it sells, probably because it catchy, it's catchy, probably because it adds a little bit of shine on what we are doing. What is it? And then the term Twilight Zone, somebody mentioned the word Twilight Zone and I was trying to remember what it meant to me and what it meant to other people. And I remember that there is this TV show in the 70s. Some of the oldies here may know what it, I watched it, so I'm an oldie. Uh, it, was a, a show, it was a show, an American show in the 70s. It was a science fiction show that it shows a lot of mysteries, right? And I went to look for the description of the Twilight Zone, what is said about uh, the show, and this is what I found, and I'm going to read it to you. It is a dimension as vast as a space, and I standless and infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is a dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call Twilight Zone. And I thought, this is teacher empowerment. <laughs> Doesn't it? Think about it. It is some, this is vast area between superstition and science, between the light and shadow. It completely represented where I think we are in terms of teacher empowerment. Because if you think about it, we use the term, but we don't really know what it means. We seem to want it, but we don't want to really talk about it. We seem to propose it, but we don't really know how actually we could come about it or how to promote it, in fact. So we are in the twilight zone, okay? So if we agree that we are there, let's try to think of how we can leave the twilight zone a little bit by lighting the way. Let's say how we can move from the shadow closer into the light, okay? Shall we? So, the questions that I would like to answer in today's session are basically these two ones. See, we are lighting the way. Why do we mean by teacher empowerment? Okay, how do we understand it? And then a second more critical question, are we truly empowering teachers? Because we claim we are. That is why we seem to find this expression everywhere. So are we? So the first thing that I'm going to ask you for your help is I'm going to ask you to have a little pair work discussion, OK? 
okay? Pair work. The activity you love asking your students to do, but you hate doing yourselves. <laughs> That's exactly that, okay? So, you laugh, it's true, it's true. Okay, so, discussion. What do you understand by teacher empowerment? Your understandings, not from any reading, not from any definition, how do you understand it, okay? Take a few couple of seconds to do that. I don't know how I'm going to silence you later, but we'll see about that in a few seconds, okay? Go. Time's up. Hello. Oh, you're doing it. Thank you, it wasn't my intention. My intention was panicking. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, let's try to see now whether your understandings of teacher empowerment are in some and somehow connected to the actual definition of the word teacher empowerment, okay? So, um, again, as many other concepts, it's very difficult to find a single definition. Practically, this happens with everything, uh, with every, uh, you know, very abstract uh, concept. If you look for the meaning of teacher empowerment, you're going to find that many people would say it's a very fuzzy concept. Empowerment in itself is very fuzzy and hard to define. Teacher empowerment is also difficult to define. Um, it depends a lot of the context, it depends on societal behaviors, it depends on the person, on the situation. But if you look for different definitions, there are some common ideas or, or concepts that seem to come up. And this would be kind of a summary of the definition of teacher empowerment. A process whereby teachers develop autonomy to make decisions, and exercise their professional judgment about how and what to teach. Similar to what you said? Yeah, in a way, probably, yes, maybe, okay? Maybe not. So, from this definition there is, and from the different discussions about teacher empowerment, there is something that is not clear and there are discrepancies on, whether we could actually uh, empower teachers. Some people think, that we cannot empower teachers because empowerment is self-initiated. But the jury is not out. There are discrepancies. So the question is, can we actually give power to teachers? Uh, or is, on the other way around, is actually the fact that teachers need to empower themselves? Can, could an external agent empower teachers just by giving it to them? Or actually is more of a enabling, providing enabling factors that could help that uh, empowerment. It seems to be, though, that both uh, are equally important. Teachers' self-initiation of empowerment, it means the desire to be empowered, but also external factors that would facilitate such empowerment. So the two need to coexist, okay? External conditions and the teacher's own desire to be empowered. And also, the one thing that comes in all the literature about empowerment, even though some of them have different names, are six dimensions that are related to teacher empowerment. Impact, self-efficacy, professional growth, status, autonomy, and decision-making. Impact has to do with teachers' perceptions that they are making an impact uh, in their job. What, what, what this means is that they feel that their job is worthwhile, that what they, were, what they are doing really has an effect in society, 
you know, all teachers would really have an effect on our students in more ways than just the curriculum, okay? So that would be impact. And then self-efficacy relates to our teaching objectives, to our learning objectives. How well we feel our students are learning based on what we do. So how good am I as a teacher to achieve learning, okay? That's self-efficacy. Then professional growth has to do with my perceptions um, about the opportunities I have to develop and grow. So learning opportunities, opportunities to develop, opportunities to share, that's professional growth. Status has to do with how I see myself in terms of my status as a professional, how other people respect my job, how colleagues respect me, how society respect me as a teacher, okay? That's the status. Autonomy is the freedom of choice that I have regarding things that involve my classroom, and decision-making is my level of participation in decisions involving my job inside and outside of the classroom, okay? Those are the six dimensions of empowerment. Now, when I was checking all this information and reading about the literature, I realized that most of this comes from general education. It's hardly anything written on teacher empowerment in English language teaching, hardly anything. Most of this comes from general education. In fact, when I was looking for papers that would focus on this in English language teaching, I found only three papers that looked at this and that involved some research on perceptions of teachers, on the effects of teacher empowerment. The three of these papers came from Iran and Saudi Arabia, only three. Only three papers about teacher empowerment. I mean, it's very little, especially if we see teacher empowerment everywhere. But that is why I thought that maybe the amount of information that I was collecting was not giving me a full notion of what teacher empowerment was. I, I felt like I needed more. I needed to see how teachers experience empowerment. So that is when I decided I need to listen to teachers' voices. I need to know their perceptions of empowerment, how they experience it. So this is what we are going to do now in the next section. We are going to move on to listening to teachers' perceptions of empowerment, what they said. And I did this um, um, by sending a survey. Um, through social media, I shared a survey that I adapted from an existing uh, questionnaire uh, that was looking at teachers' perceptions of teacher empowerment, um, looking at it in relation to the six dimensions. Remember the six dimensions? So according to that, I, I gave them a questionnaire and then I added two additional questions. Anybody here answer the questionnaire? Okay, thank you. Um, 400 people answered the questionnaire uh, in total and they are distributed like so in the world. Of course, South and Central America uh, uh, numbers are bigger because my, my, ne my network of contacts and friends are there. Um, and I'm going to focus this presentation on the second part of the questionnaire, which is the bit where I focus on the two open questions. What I ask teachers here is, uh, could you please tell me stories of empowerment or stories of disempowerment? Because I wanted to know how they experience it, okay? So, the first question was, is, please share a story of empowerment. So this is what I'm going to share with you now. If I asked you, you prefer to hear the good news or the bad news, you would say the bad news, but I'm going to start with the good news. Stories of empowerment from English language teachers are basically um, limited to three main dimensions. Autonomy, professional growth, and self-efficacy. If I, if I connect their stories with their dimension, that is where they are. Um, this one, for example, is connected to self-efficacy. Many teachers shared a stories like this. Many. I thought it would be a couple. Many of them. For them, they feel empowered when they notice that they are able to achieve learning when they feel that they are effective, when they feel that they are able to do what they are meant to do, okay? Achieve uh, learning objectives in the classroom. The second one has to do with autonomy. So, 
So again, even though there are certain constraints where the teachers need to work under, they still feel that they have certain autonomy to make decisions regarding materials, regarding how and what to teach, okay? That is what makes them feel empowered. And finally, something that has to do with professional growth. Many teachers, again, when I asked them about to share stories about empowerment, told stories like this. When I go to conferences, when I participate in talks, when I uh, I'm take part in workshops, when I feel like I'm learning, when I can share with my colleagues, many of them said that. So when I was reading all this information, I was wondering, again, and connected with other ideas that I'm going to mention later, is that it seems to be that when teachers uh, participate in professional development activities, they feel empowered. They feel that they can have the power to achieve learning, to be better, to have an impact. However, I wonder whether all, in fact, professional development activities can be, in fact, empowering. I think I told you at the beginning that I went to a number of talks that mentioned empowerment, and I never was quite sure how empowerment could be come about or could actually happen. Um, so if you also try to remember the definition of empowerment, there are elements there that I'm not sure all professional activities uh, do uh, you know, address. So I think about the following. To what degree do workshops, talks, and courses truly empower teachers? I told you that I went to a number of workshops that I went in and I learned and I left the workshop knowing nothing but a song or a game or a video. If the video was about, for example, the weather, um, then I could use it only if I'm talking about the weather or about the language activity that was being covered at the moment, but I didn't know whether there was anything else. So if empowerment involves so many, so much more than just um, professional growth or learning new things, but it involves autonomy. Is all professional development empowering then? Do they always promote autonomy or professional judgment? I'm still uncertain about whether it all does, but we are going to go back to this in a minute. So if I can summarize, when do teachers feel empowered? When do teachers feel empowered? Well when they learn, when they share, when they are able to innovate, and when they see that their students are learning, okay? There is a moment when they feel empowered, okay? Ready to hear the bad news? Maybe not. So, I asked teachers again about their stories of disempowerment. Tell me moments when you have felt disempowered. This is what uh, some of the things that they said. We are going to start with Does it ring a bell? Yeah. So, if we go back to what I said before, professional development does make you feel empowered. So you go to a talk, you go to a conference, you learn a lot, you feel empowered. You go back to your institution with new ideas, but your ideas are not accepted or are not heard. That's the end of your empowerment. Okay? So, that is why, one, the professional development activity that you're going to engage in needs to be empowered, but also the external conditions seem to be important. And this is what has been said in the literature. It's not just a question of self-initiated power, but it's also power with others. It's, it's of no use that if you develop yourself professionally, and then you're going to go into an institution and you're not going to have the possibilities to exercise that new knowledge. So whatever institution you're working in needs to enable uh, the conditions to enable such empowerment so that you are able to exercise it, okay? So that is one of the first thing that we need to keep in mind in terms of empowerment. Then moving on, before I continue to the next uh, 
area of disempowerment. I just want to find out, since only a few people here answered the survey, I want to find out about people here. Raise your hand, please. Raise your hand if you are a teacher, teaching young learners, teaching teenagers, teaching adults, teaching teachers, if you actually have any teaching job. Oh, I cannot see very much from anyone. Okay. It's, I don't think it's everybody, but it's a big number of people because there are also managers here, there are book uh, writers, there are writers, okay? So, this is my question for you teachers. Sorry, uh, I don't want to um, uh, um, discriminate managers or book authors, uh, but this question is just for teachers. Let's, let's teachers be the center of the world for a minute. Okay, so do you take part in decisions regarding the following? I'm going to go one by one. Do you take decisions regarding the following? If you do, you, are, you take part in decisions, you raise your hand, okay? Do you take part in decisions regarding Just wondering. <laughs> Raise your hand. Lucky one. Anybody else? Yes. Two, three, okay. A couple of, some lucky four or five. <laughs> Better than zero. Okay. B, schedules. Scheduling, organization of the hours, times. Ooh, lucky 20 or something, or 30. Okay, so things are getting better. Good. C, course book selection. Okay, this is more. This is what I expected. This is more. Okay, thank you. I'm assuming that the people that participate in course book selection is because probably you work in a relatively small school relatively small school so that you can help in the decision making. I can tell you from experience that maybe s state school teachers cannot really be involved in course book selection that much, but if you can have a say in course book selection, like you, yay. Okay, so let's see what teachers say about the issue, these issues of decision making. So, they change the length of class, they change class sizes, they make decisions regarding course books, and teachers are never consulted. Does it ring a bell? Yeah. And many, and the, what is interesting here is that by default, we assume that this is not the job of the teacher, because teachers are there to teach. But as these teachers said, it impacts our work. It's not the same to teach 10 that all of a sudden to teach 20. It's not the same to teach 30 that all of a sudden to teach 45. It's not the same to teach on a course book that you know uh, fits the program objectives than to teach a course that has nothing to do even with your learner needs. And that is what usually happens in this case. Uh, now I'm going to ask you one last question regarding your participation in decision-making processes. Last question. Do you take part in decisions regarding the following? Okay. So, some, but not that many. This is what a teacher said about this. So teachers need to follow a curriculum designed by the Ministry of Education, right? This is particularly the case for state school, for public school teachers that work in school, in the school system. If you work in a small language school or in a small institution, probably in a university, you have a say. If you work in a school, probably you don't have any say at all. And probably that affects the way you relate to students, the way you adapt to their needs, etc. There is no possibility of adaptation. This element of this aspect of decision-making has been widely discussed in the literature. 
What it has been said is that teachers in general, in terms of curriculum design, are completely absent of any say in terms of curriculum design or adaptation, okay? Or even initial steps into curriculum design. Um, Again, there is this belief that teachers maybe are not prepared for it, maybe that teachers don't know, maybe that they don't have the ability to do that. The problem is that we teachers are teaching the curriculum, we are teaching the syllabus. So maybe we need to wonder whether actually it's fair that we are uh, considered to be an, an outsider to that process. Sometimes, actually, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and they think that maybe teachers can participate. And what they do is that they consult teachers' opinions. And how they do that is they give you some kind of checklist. They give you some sort of framework for you to tick boxes. So what do you think regarding this and this and this? And you tick boxes and sometimes you give comments. Have you done things like that about the curriculum? The problem is, is when you do things like that, that are so constrained, what happens is that then when you check the final curriculum document, you don't really see your opinions there. So your opinions, your feedback, doesn't really reach the final document. And this again has been discussed in the literature. This is what Martin Weddell calls cosmetic consultation. <laughs> so you are consulted, but then nothing really happens. It's just, basically they do it just because to tick the consultation box. Did you ask the teachers? Oh yeah, yes, we did, we did, we did, we did. And they have a lot of papers to prove it, but actually how that transferred to the final document is probably inexistent. So, in which moments teachers feel disempowered? When they cannot decide on issues which affect their work, when their expertise is undervalued or ignored. Those are the disempowerment, those where most of the disempowerment stories are. And here I would like to draw your attention to this, to the concept of expertise. When I was coding all the answers from teachers, this is 400, 400, oh my God, 400. When I was coding all the information from teachers, the word ignored, ignored, undervalued, ignored, not heard, appeared many, 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 many times. So it seems to happen a lot. And then I couldn't help but thinking teachers are undervalued in their expertise. Now, expertise is in the hands of experts, right? Expertise, experts, in the hands of experts. But usually, if you think about it, when, and I remember even when I was working at school, and they usually, um, they hired somebody to help the school to develop any form of new curriculum or to develop a new program or solve a problem, they would hire experts, meaning I'm not one. And then even if you look at, if you go to different conferences and you check the brochure, the brochure sometimes says, meet the expert. It's not you, right? It's not us. So I've always wondered who are the experts? Yes, they write the books, they probably write um, research, but again, we are not them. So when did we stop calling ourselves experts? When did that happen? I don't remember. But at some moment, we stopped calling ourselves experts uh, by some strange reason, and I think our field has a lot of responsibility on that as well. It's happened in all fields, but I think English language teaching has a lot to say about that. We, as I said at the beginning, we are obsessed with who is saying what. We all are. We are very focused on our experts. We are very focused on our gurus. And I just wonder how much of our obsession, fixation for the guru, could actually disregard the expertise of teachers. Because we are experts too. There is expertise in what we do. Are we, by looking at what gurus have to say, are we disregarding or silences our own voices and what we have to say? Um, because what is the risk here? The risk here is that maybe because of our 
admiration, sometimes veneration, for gurus, what happens is, is that we uh, become complacent because I'm waiting for somebody to give me the theory. I'd wait for somebody to give me the answers instead of me going out to look for the answers ourselves. And we are all in this together. We have all developed this culture of the guru. And there is a risk. There is a risk of us not trusting our own expertise. I'm going to show you an example of that now. I'm going to show you a letter written in 1939, 80 years ago. So this has been a problem always. There is this person, George, who wrote a letter to an expert in English composition, okay? George wrote that letter because he felt something that he noticed in his practice didn't really add up to what the experts were saying. So he felt something is missing. Something is not quite right. There is something that I noticed in my classroom that has not been mentioned and maybe more research is needed, okay? That is what he, he started the letter saying this. And then at some point, he continues his letter saying the following, and I'm going to read just to help you. But as teachers of English, we naturally cannot be expected to do such research. Our main interests, we are constantly told, are or should be literary history or literary criticism. And teachers of composition are and can expect to be only pedagogic pretenders, academic proletarians, section hands, doers of drudgery, and unhappy disillusioned men and women without hope of professional or financial reward. <laughs> if despite such a present and future, we take our compositional task seriously and try conscientiously to help our students improve in their writing, we must, in sheer desperation, if you will pardon a left-handed compliment, look to you and to you only for guidance and assistance in the solution of our compositional problems. So, what this letter is saying in a very sarcastic way, that A, you start questioning sometimes what the experts are telling you, but B, because you're a teacher, you know that you cannot question. So in a way, we become complacent, we start doubting ourselves, and then our expertise becomes silence. And that is one risk of the guru, okay? Another risk. I found a tweet uh, uh, coming, uh, created by a guru that will remain unnamed. This guru is an American researcher, very well-known American researcher and guru who tweeted the following. Huh. This tweet had a lot of likes, many likes. So that's why it appeared in my, uh, it's not ELT guru, okay? It's not an ELT guru. But it appeared in my tweet feed and, now, and I looked at it and I was like, I don't see a lot to like in that tweet, but maybe it's me, maybe I'm being oversensitive. So then I checked again, I checked again, and I'm like, is it only me? Is it me, is, am, am, I, am I being picky? And I checked some of the answers, and there were many answers, retweets and answers, replies to this, and I found these two. When I read it, especially the last one, I felt so sad. I felt so sad because sometimes experts or gurus do not notice the value and the power of their words. And if we are not careful about how we say things, we, like I'm a guru, I'm not a guru. Um, but we need to be so careful about our words that if we are not careful, what we do is just we start this blame game 
this is blame. It's blaming teachers without really understanding the conditions on, on how things actually happen. And then administrators or a school principal may read this, and then, and then this principal goes with that idea into a meeting, and then the teacher feels bad that they're not being good enough. So I think gurus in general need to be very careful. I can argue, they can argue that teachers have some responsibility over what happens in their classroom. Of course they do. But I don't think that we are going to achieve much if we are trying to raise um, the status of the status of teaching by lowering teachers' morale or lowering teachers' feelings of uh, effectiveness or efficacy, okay? So I think that is something that we need to question. So again, one of the questions that I ask myself is, is our guruism disregarding teachers' voices or maybe even silencing them? Because it's very hard to speak to a guru and say, you know, I disagree with you. You need to really have to do that. You know, because he's a, it's a, he's a guru. I mean, that is what happens. And then what I wonder is also, who are we empowering in fact? Who are we empowering when we do all this, when we uh, venerate our gurus? Are we empowering teachers or are we empowering gurus? Who are we empowering? Now, this is not to say that I blame gurus for this. Um, because we have all created this. And I'm not going to go into the topic of whether gurus are women or men, even though they usually are, or whether they are <laughs> non-natives or natives, they usually are, or whether they are the right gurus to follow, maybe not all of them are, but the fact that we are so guru-obsessed, uh, and, and that I think that is... Uh, jeopardizing our expertise. Now, I'm not saying gurus are not necessary. We need theories, we need evidence, we need, uh, we need them, we need researchers, we need them. So I, I'm not going to, I, I don't believe that the anything approach goes. We need them, but I just think we need to use our professional judgment to actually value what we are being told and if possible question things, okay? So, Finally, the final teacher voice that I think is important, that I think is going to show us where we are in terms of empowerment. Um, because of some of the constraints we have been talked about and because of all this obsession that we have for the guru, what usually happens is that we end up noticing that we confirm. Because teacher empowerment is so hard to achieve that we end up feeling, okay, I'm going to confirm to the little reality that I can actually manage. And this is an example of that. This is a story of empowerment, but I couldn't help but thinking, this teacher feels empowered in that little space of the classroom. And this teacher is happy with that space. But teacher empowerment is such an all-encompassing term. It shouldn't be just the classroom. So at the end of the day, what happens is that English teacher's empowerment is mostly circumscribed to the classroom. So you're empowered only behind the classroom walls. And that is not what empowerment is. And probably because we are equating teacher empowerment with professional development, we are also promoting the view that only when you learn and when you are in the classroom, you're empowerment. And it should be just so much more than that. So going back to the questions, what do we mean by teacher empowerment? And are we truly empowering teachers? After looking at all the evidence from theory, from research, and listening to teachers' voices, this is what I can get in summary from, all, from everything that I have learned. In summary, our understandings of teacher empowerment are partial, as have been our efforts to achieve it. So, we are in the twilight zone. We are there. And at some point, we need to leave. We need to start understanding what teacher empowerment is. And we need to stop using the word just to make things shiny and understand what it means to actually empower teachers. So, if we try to leave the twilight zone, 
if we are going to try to start to live at least, there are some recommendations, some, some general principles. I'm not going to give you tips because I will be contradicting myself. <laughs> Besides, it's a very, it's a process that takes time, takes effort, takes uh, compromise, commitment from all of those involved. But there are some things that we need to take into consideration. Democratic decision making in your institutions involving all your colleagues and all of you there, uh, having clarity about the need for everybody to be involved in take decisions. This is in big decisions regarding educational change or in more small decisions. Um, um, taking risks because involving everybody in decision making is going to, it's going to mean making mistakes and those mistakes should be okay. Collaborative, uh, collaborative action, teachers should be involved, colleagues should be involved, managers should be involved. Teachers, this is for all of us, as teachers, we need, to be, you need, we need to want to be empowered. We need to look for empowerment. We cannot ask for people to give it to us if we don't do enough for it. Related to teacher empowerment is teachers' working conditions. Teachers' working conditions are really something that we need to question. Um, I would say, if I want to conclude from all the, the data that I collected, teachers are used and abused mostly, but hardly ever empowered. They are used by um, gurus and writers to sell their theories and their books. They are used by researchers to, to use them for their research, me included, guilty as charged. The, they are uh, abused by their business owners and by governments who provide them with uh, questionable working conditions, and that is an understatement. Um, so they are used and abused. And yes, well-established researchers should not use such a strong words, but I am not a well-established researcher. Remember that I am a micro celebrity. <laughs> so what the hell? So, teachers, work for your working conditions. Join a union if there isn't one, build one. Um, finally, try to think of ways to develop yourself professionally, something that is teacher-led, and I believe that one way to promote professional development that is truly empowering is teacher research. Teacher research is a way that would allow you to look at your own ways of teaching to how you teach, to understand how you teach, to theorize the way you teach. Uh, it's also an opportunity for you to inform the field. The field cannot be informed, continue to be informed by people that are not in classrooms. They are not in classrooms. They have the best intentions, but you need to inform the field. And one way to do that is by teacher research. And please, let's stop trying to find alternative names for research, okay? It's not investigation, it's not inquiry, it's research. If we call it by a different name, what we are doing is we are doing a disservice to the empowering nature of research. <laughs> Let's legitimize teacher research as research. It's not the same kind of knowledge that will come from academic research, but it's valuable. It's different. It's not worse, okay? It's not less valuable. So, I would invite many of you, if you have the opportunity to do research, research, uh, teacher research, but this is not a call to say that you need to do it. You need to be supported to do it, which is different. I'm not saying you should, I'm saying the support needs to be there. Um, I know that this is necessary because, again, many other people have been written theories of teaching that are not teachers themselves. Teachers are silent because nobody wants to hear what they have to say. So we need to come up and speak up and try to develop ways in which our voices, our stories, our experiences are heard so that theory involves what happens in the classroom. An initial step into teacher empowerment is to listen to teachers' voices, is to understand our working theories, to understand what happens in the classroom. So if there is anything that I could say that would get us there, that would get us to become empowered, for you teachers to become empowered, and for managers, this is for you, managers, writers, conference, organizers, if I could just say one single message, and I say this from the heart as a teacher myself, 
And as my colleagues, start with one single thing, please. Just listen to us. We have a lot to say. Just listen to us. Thank you very much.